Governor, we have such an honor and privilege to have you here and Governor Hogan from Maryland. But the most important thing that I found out during this, during this all this process is how the students, they be part of this process. It's so important. So we asked the, two the three principals to have one designated student to ask the question. We, they were very hard to have those questions. And you know, those questions are not like other people being booked, caught in the back, and they know the answer before the questions. Right. <laughs> I don't even know the questions. Do I know it? <laughs> okay, we'll start with Mr. Barnes. All right. Well, actually, Mr. Barnes, ladies first. Mrs. Harrington, where is she? <laughs> Mrs. Harrington, are you here? Yeah, somewhere. <laughs> okay, come over here, please, if you don't mind. <laughs> Do you have any student here that has some questions? We need one student that is representing the Okay, come here, young lady. Come over, don't scare, it's okay. <laughs> she looks ready. <laughs> okay, well done, young lady. First of all, introduce yourself and welcome the governor. Hello, governor. I am Stella Jakes. Um, you said on your website that you would use existing biometric technology to make sure the immigrants wouldn't overstay their visa. Could you elaborate on how that would work? Sure. Good question. Um, here's the way it would work. Uh, every person who comes into the country on a visa would have to give their thumbprint when you come in as a visitor to this country. And that thumbprint would go on a database. And then every time you want to access services here in this country as someone who's here on a visa, you have to give that thumbprint. And it checks up against the database. And if you're here legally, then you get to use the services and continue on your day. If we find out you're here longer than you're supposed to be, then we remove you from the country. It's like this. Here's the best analogy I've come up with. Um, let's say that you invite some friends over, uh, your parents do, uh, for Christmas dinner. And so they come for Christmas dinner, and then you know how crazy it gets sometimes. You're cleaning up. Everybody's not paying attention. And then a few days later, you go upstairs to the guest room, and they're still there. <laughs> <laughs> you wanted them there for Christmas, you weren't looking for them to be there three days later, right? And so we need to have a country, not that doesn't welcome people here, we love to welcome people here, to be students, to be tourists, to see our country, to come here and work for a period of time to help, but we don't need people staying here longer than we've allowed them to stay here. They don't need to abuse our good nature. And so with that kind of system, you don't need to put anything else on people. Everybody's got their own individual tags right here on their fingers. Um, each fingerprint is unique, and that's the way it would work. Thank you for your question. Thank you, young lady. Look at Mr. Thompson. He's like, he's like, crap, baby. <laughs> Mr. Thompson, please introduce the student. Yes, I have here uh, Mary Martin, and she's going to be the first female president of the United States. All right, Mary Martin. <laughs> Thank you for coming here today, Governor, um, Governor Christie. Um, do you have any ideas on what to do for our elderly population to help them receive the care they need to help them stay at, long, at home longer? Very good, Mary. Wow. And Mary, I'm really relieved you're going to be the first female president of the United States. <laughs> Good news for America in more ways than one. Let me tell you what we do in New Jersey, Mary. Um, one of the things that we've moved to in helping to care for our elderly is to give them the option to pay for them to stay at home rather than go to an assisted living facility or to a nursing home. Um, I just believe that people are more comfortable and happier in surroundings that are familiar to them. And if we could care for our elderly, in a home setting, that they should have the option to do that, and that our Medicare and Medicaid systems should be able to pay for that and probably do it less expensively than we do in these institutions. And, and I know that so many families struggle with the decision when they don't have an option to have to put their mother or father or aunt or uncle or grandmother or grandfather in a nursing home um, away from them where they're lonely and you worry. You worry about whether they're really able to enjoy their lives. But you knew if they were in their home, in their own bed, with the proper care, the proper attention, 
that they need from healthcare professionals. That those familiar pictures are around them, those familiar sights and smells are around them that they've lived much of their life with. And that's what we should really be striving for, is to help them live out their final years on Earth in a way that um, is joyful and comfortable and takes care of their health as well. And I think we can do that. We're doing that in New Jersey now. We're seeing a lot of success um, with the elder community that not only are doing well from a health perspective, but really like being home a lot more than they would want to be having to sell their home and move to a nursing home. So uh, that's what we're doing in New Jersey, and I hope you can do that for the entire country. Madam President, nice to meet you. <laughs> He's telling me he's only have one question. What's what's wrong with this picture? Oh, Come on, man. Go on. The next question is Principal Rick Barnes from the high school we prepared with his student. Hi, Governor. Today we have uh, Jack Sainstacken with us. Nick, I'm sorry. I called my brother's name. Nick Sainstacken. Well, I'm pretty sure he's going to be president of something. All right. <laughs> I think it was my brother's actually over there. Where's Jack? Jack's over Jack, how are you? <laughs> Good morning, Governor Christie. Thank you very much for coming to Hollis this morning. Thank you, man. Um, we have a quick question. There's been a lot of talk in the news recently about barring people coming into this country based on uh, their religion and their beliefs. Uh, if the Constitution clearly states that there can be no uh, religious test for political offices, it's not a double standard. And uh, what would you propose to uh, against uh, this uh, proposal by another political candidate that should well, go unnamed? <laughs> yeah, Nick, you're like the only person in America who won't name him. That's good. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, listen, I said right when this when this statement came out, it's wrong. And and we should not be making any broad decisions on any human being based upon their religion. Um, New Jersey has the second largest Muslim American population in America. Only Michigan has more Muslim Americans in their state than New Jersey does. And so, in my six years now as governor. I've dealt frequently with the Muslim American community, and in the seven years I was U.S. Attorney, right after September 11th, it was my job to build bridges back to the Muslim American community, not only because so many of them are good, patriotic, hardworking, peaceful Americans, but also because they could help us in the war on terror by giving us intelligence and information that we need to be able to intervene before people in their community might be taking steps to attack us. Uh, here's my view on religion in this country. Everyone should be able to practice the religion they want in the way they want to, um, as long as you don't act violently and you don't try to impose your religion upon anybody else. And there is no particular religion which has cornered the market on peacefulness. There's no particular religion um, that we should be putting in one particular place just because of the nature of the religion. You have wonderful, peaceful Catholics and Jews, Protestants and Hindus and Buddhists and Muslims. And you also have members of each of those religions who have committed acts of violence. We need to judge people based upon, as Dr. King said, the content of their character. That's the way we need to be judging people in this country and the way we always should judge people in this country, not by what the color of their skin is, not by what they wear, and not by what their religious beliefs are. And so, as president, that's the way I would talk about it, and that's the way I would lead. And I think we'd have a better and more unified country, rather than dividing this country in that way. We need to try to bring our country together, and that's exactly what I intended to do as president. It's a great question, Nick. Thank you very much. Thank you, Susan. Do you have a question, ma'am? California, and I'm sure you know we have the bathroom bill that was passed without voting, which means that um, children from K to 12 can use any bathroom or gym that they choose at the time if they feel like they're a girl, if they're a boy. Or... <coughs> We've heard that the federal government is considering passing the same, and I'd just like their opinion on that. I don't know. You know, listen, I'm from New Jersey. <laughs> not from California. And so, you know, life in New Jersey, I never thought I'd say this, is relatively simple <laughs> compared to what you're dealing with. Men go to men's rooms. Women go to women's rooms. And 
there really shouldn't be a whole lot of confusion about that in terms of <laughs> public accommodations. Um, and I don't think we should be making life more confusing for our children. Life is confusing enough right now for our children. Think about those kids in Los Angeles who last week had their entire school district closed because of a threat. Think about what they felt like the next day when they went back to school. Did they feel completely comfortable? Did they feel like they were safe? How did their mothers and fathers feel when they sent them to school that day? And now today the national schools are closed, based on a threat as well. How are those kids going to feel when they go back to school? See, when terrorists attack a, um, a Center for the Development of the Disabled in San Bernardino, California, that means that every place in America is a potential target for terrorism. ISIS is not like Al-Qaeda, everybody. Al-Qaeda wanted to do big things. The World Trade Center, the USS Cole, American embassies, the Pentagon. ISIS just wants American blood. And we need to make sure that we don't make our children's lives more confusing and more challenging than they are already living in the world that they live in today. Children learn better, grow up better, mature better when they live in a safe and secure and loving environment. And, you know, it's interesting, I'll, I'll, I'll end with this. Um, also, we should stop having, them, having to make so many decisions, right? I, I you know, I talked to, to my friend Mark Zuckerberg, and I asked him one time why he always wears the gray t-shirt and the same pair of pants and the same sneakers all the time. I said, Mark, why are you dressed that way all the time? He said, it's to prevent decision fatigue. <laughs> so like, I have so many decisions to make. If I don't have to decide what to wear every morning, and I just wear exactly the same thing, that's one less decision to make. And when I get to work, it makes me much better because i got more in the tank to make more decisions. <laughs> Hogan and I, you know, governing Maryland and New Jersey, we can get decision fatigue sometimes. The fact, though, is that we want our kids not have to decide which bathroom they get to go in and not to be subject to peer pressure about which one to go in, and not to be subject to the embarrassment that could come with going in a bathroom where someone maybe doesn't agree that they should be in there or not. Why do we do this to our children? It, it doesn't make any sense, so I don't know. I'm the common sense guy from New Jersey. You know, I, I don't think life needs to be this complicated. I think it needs to be a lot more straightforward. Well, there you go. <laughs> Thank our Hollis Police Department for making this event possible. Yes. Thank you. We have the fire chief town. He's always here to assist with any even having any mishaps here. I have a question for the second From my family owns a small business um, just in Merrimack next town over, and we do a lot of business with Maurice, and we're very thankful for his support that he gives us, but we know he struggles also owning a small business. My family owns a small 28-bed assisted living home where we provide wonderful care for our elders, but we're really being um, pinched by Medicaid regulations and uh, CMS coming down and creating all these rules that somebody's sitting in an office in D.C. creating rules and don't even know how it works in a home environment. And it's pinching our small homes out of funding for um, our seniors that deserve the funding that they need. Um, is, do you have any suggestions on ways that we can deal with CMS and get them to uh, kind of um, be a little less stringent? Um, so I'd like to hear your thoughts on small business and um, CMS is a center for, center for Medicaid services. Um. If you ever had to deal with them, they're a three-letter curse word, um, is what they are. Um, my, my short suggestion is elect a new president. Um, and, and, and here's the thing. This, this administration in 2014, we don't have to totally get for 2015. But for 2014, they issued 81,000 new pages of federal regulation just in the year 2014. 
It's the most regulation ever issued in one year by the federal government in the history of our country. For a small business owner like you, um, it costs $10,000 per employee to comply with federal regulation. And if you were a manufacturer, it costs you $34,000 per employee to, com to, to comply with the Obama era regulation. So we're going to do what I did in New Jersey. In New Jersey, we had the same thing. Two liberal governors before me, big regulation. In fact, the woman who ran the EPA for Barack Obama ran our state environmental protection department for my predecessor. So I know how to clean up these messes. Um, I signed my first executive order was to ban was to, to bar any new regulation from any state department or agency for 90 days, and to send my lieutenant governor out um, across the state to meet with small businesses in public forums and hear about the regulations that were the most expensive, the most ridiculous, the least effective, and the ones that drove them the most crazy. I said to them, bring your list and give it to the Lieutenant Governor. I'll do the same thing as President, except the federal government's a lot bigger, so we'll do a 180-day moratorium, and we'll send the Vice President out to do this. What we did in New Jersey was at the end of our first year, we got rid of one-third of all the regulation put in place by my predecessor. And it really lifted things off the back of small businesses in the state. The only way to fix this is to give you the freedom to make the decisions you need to make and allow you to compete. And if you're providing good service and the families that entrust their loved ones to you believe that you're caring for them and giving them a loving, caring, healthy environment, um, that should be the market test. Not checking certain boxes from CMS that have nothing to do with those factors. Um, and so I can tell you when we tried to go to managed care for Medicaid in New Jersey, now managed care is nothing new. It took them two years to approve our request. Two years. I mean, you know, this is why America is slowing to a crawl from a business perspective and a job creation perspective. Because Barack Obama, Hillary Clinton, that whole crew believes that they should pick the winners and losers. They should decide who the winners and losers are in America. Here's what my administration will say. The winners and losers will be determined by two things. The ingenuity that you bring to your job every day and the depth of your work ethic. If you work hard and you have a great idea, I want you to be successful in America. And if you don't work hard and you don't have a great idea, you won't be. And the government shouldn't be doing anything to make sure that the person who doesn't work hard and doesn't have a great idea, you know, gets, gets some success and they shouldn't be penalizing you for working hard and having great ideas. America has always been great because its people have had better ideas than the rest of the world and worked harder than anybody else in the world. We need to return to that ethic in this country. If we do, our economy will grow and our people will be happier. Your time is up. So before your time is up, I'm going to ask Governor Holden if he'd like to close it up with your remarks. Go. Well, uh, you know, it's hard to follow an act like that. I mean, really put me on the spot there. You know, I, I, I just, again, want to thank everybody for being here today. I truly believe that this country is at a turning point, that we need a real leader in the White House. And I think that many of you will agree with me, and hopefully most of the people in New Hampshire are going to agree with me, that Chris Christie is that leader and should be and will be the next president of the United States. Rock TV.